Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the mostly so or South African Labour session um, on the last day of the CSAE conference. Um, uh, I'm going to start off. Well, we're going to start off with Doug Kutswa presenting on transitions into informal employment and analysis in South African panel data. Good morning. I'm from the African Capacity Building Foundation, and. Uh, this paper is actually a paper from my master's research, Transitions into Informal Employment and Analysis of South African Panel Data. I hope this won't be the predicament of this uh, session, and I hope everyone will be on time, and I hope I'll be able to cover everything that uh, I have planned to. So this will be the outline of the presentation. So, in South Africa, there is high unemployment levels. The broad and narrow rates were 34% and 26.7 for 2017. Um, in such a case, we wouldn't expect that uh, in such a labor market, there'll be uh, a lot of movements, and we wouldn't expect that there'll be voluntary movements out of employment. However, uh, research shows that uh, there is high mobility rates of labor across the labor market states in South Africa, which is not what we would expect. Um, however, even though there is high mobility rates of labor, uh, research shows that there is low levels of informal employment in South Africa compared to other countries other developing countries, uh, as you can see from this diagram, uh, the informal employment levels for South Africa were 32.7 for uh, 2010, and other countries have higher rates. So the coexistence of uh, high unemployment yet Low informal employment is very puzzling. So although there have been studies that have sought to explain why, why informal employment is low in South Africa compared to other countries, um, the puzzle has not been uh, fixed and the, the question of mobility is underexplored. Some of the reasons for, for, for why, why informal employment is low are undercapturing of uh, of informal employment due to the uh, questions that are asked in surveys, uh, specifically the uh, quarterly labor force survey in South Africa. And uh, another reason why it's low is that there are barriers to entry, especially uh, into informal self-employment. So the objective of this uh, research was to explore that amidst the barriers to entry into informal employment and all the other reasons that have been uh, a broad cross why informal employment is small in South Africa is that uh, to explore which types of workers are more likely to move into informal employment and the characteristics of interest were with these ones gender, age, education, race, marital status, and location. Uh, the study methods, I, I used a transition matrices to, to see which workers moved from unemployment and to, to, to see uh, the mobility across labor market states. And so I also used a simple property regression. Then, uh, so for the data source, uh, I preferred using the National Income Dynamic Study, uh, which follows the same individuals. So I used the 2008 wave and the 2012 wave this is the advantage of following the same individuals compared to the quarterly uh, labor force survey, which follows households instead. Uh, so I separated the, 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 the panel into different labor market states, and I used the broad definition of informal employment, which, which includes even uh, those working in the formal sector, but with informal jobs. So as we can see from the diagram, um, 
most workers are not economically active and uh, and between unemployment and 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 between 2008 and 2012 um, there were not much changes in terms of the composition of uh, of, of, of the workers in those different states. And then uh, from the tr transitional analysis, there are many things we can uh, figure out. Uh, first of all is that uh, there's a lot of churning in the labor market, which, which is along uh, other studies that have been done. Uh, <clears throat> the, 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 the most immobile uh, state is formal wage employment, as we would expect, because formal, those in formal employment would not, uh, would not leave, would not uh, prefer to leave that, that, that sector. And uh, we can see that uh, there's, there's only about 20% of workers who move from unemployment to informal employment. That includes uh, informal wage employment and self-employment. And we can see that only 5% of workers move from unemployment to informal, informal self-employment, uh, which, which, uh, which is a mere reflection that they are barriers to entry. And then, as of interest, we see that from um, informal wage employment to uh, formal wage employment, there's actually 10%, uh, which reflects that, uh, a mere reflection that uh, this, uh, this can be it's a, it's a stepping stone. Informal wage employment is a stepping stone to formal employment. And um, we can see a reverse transition from informal jobs to, for example, unemployment and the not economically active, uh, about 20% and 34%, and about 18% and 36%, which shows that, you know, uh, informal jobs are uh, are not for the long term and are just, uh, most of them are casual jobs and don't, don't last for long. Um, and then uh, results from the economic metric analysis, uh, which is the most interesting part. Uh, the first one, the first, actually the sec this column here uh, represents movements from unemployment to informal employment. And I also separated movements from unemployment into informal wage employment and uh, informal self-employment. So this, uh, this column, which is of much interest to, to us, uh, shows that, um, um, for example, this one, in terms of age, it, it shows that uh, the older workers are less likely to move in, into informal employment and and those with uh, primary education are, are less likely. Well, this, these ones are less likely compared to the younger ones, uh, which is 15 to, 15 to 34, which is the youth, and shows that um, uh, in terms of education, those with primary education are less likely compared to those with no education, and those with secondary are less likely, those with higher education are less likely. Then in terms of race, uh, Whites are less likely to move into informal employment, uh, meaning that Africans are more likely. And then uh, uh, the, these ones are also interesting. Uh, this is for higher education, meaning that uh, uh, those with higher education are less likely to move into uh, informal self-employment. Uh, um, and then uh, I, I interacted the, 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 the marriage uh, variable with the, the gender, and the married uh, workers who are also cohabiting and who are females uh, are more likely to move into informal self-employment. Yeah. Um, so from these results, uh, which are quite a lot, uh, shows that um, most workers who are marginalized from uh, formal employment opportunities, especially in the South African context, uh, such as uh, uh, 
young, uneducated Africans are the ones who are more likely to move into informal employment. Uh, so what's the conclusion from these results? Is that, <clears throat> first of all, is that few workers transition into informal employment uh, in South Africa, and barriers to informal self-employment are non-negligible. They're there, and uh, the policies which have been implemented uh, ever since South Africa achieved uh, democracy have, have not really engaged sufficiently with the importance of informal employment growth. Uh, and in South Africa, there are two opposing, well, in, in most developing countries and most, most, researchers, most researchers have two opposing views on informal employment. Uh, the, the other one is that it's inferior and it should be gotten rid of. And, uh, and the other one is that uh, it, it can help a lot of people uh, uh, um, come out from the poverty trap. For, from these results, since we find out that the, the workers who are marginalized from formal employment opportunities are the most likely to move into informal employment, uh, the results can suggest that uh, you know, informal employment has the potential to, to, to promote inclusive growth, growth uh, and, and and help these uh, marginalized workers to, to come out of the poverty trap. And uh, from the transition matrices that I showed you, uh, we saw a lot of uh, workers from um, informal wage employment moving, well, it's about 10%, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's quite something. They moved into formal employment. So uh, informal employment can actually be a stepping stone to getting uh, better and quality jobs and recent research by uh, recent research in South Africa shows that uh, informal employment actually had poverty reducing effectiveness uh, which was high uh, which was almost the same as formal sector employment so um, the suggestions are that um, informal employment should be viewed in positive light especially in South Africa uh, where there is high inequality uh, and pol policies should seek to reduce barriers to entry and, and government should aim to, you know, uh, reduce the barriers to entry that many workers face, we, which, which have been uh, researched on by many authors, uh, which, which include uh, lack of infrastructure, lack of training, lack of finance. So if the government addresses those, it can actually address inequality and uh, reduce poverty in, in South Africa. Uh, thank you. I think that's all for my research. You can remain standing. Um, I, I don't have notes. I'll just uh, discuss from here. Yeah. Um, thank you. I, yeah. Very interesting. It, I did one of my PhD, PhD chapters was very much the same work, so oh, okay. I've got yeah. more than more than five minutes worth of, of, <laughs> of notes for you. Okay. Um, yeah. So most of my comments are, are going to be purely on your empirical work. Uh, okay. I think your policy conclusions are definitely more insightful than than, than my work was. Um, okay. The so first of all, I, I'll. I love the, the transition matrices because I think we often go into regressions too quickly before actually discussing what is going around. And I think a lot of empirical researchers, if you ask them basic descriptive uh, questions about South Africa, they have no intuition for what's actually going on. So uh, um, I'm a big fan of, of transition matrices. And I'll, you also do really well in, in not um, interpreting them as causal in your, in your paper. You, in descriptive before you go to the empirical work. Um, a couple of questions. The, the first one I have is you use uh, only two waves of NEDs and you use a four year period. Yeah. Uh, it seems like a weird long period. Uh, you might have an exact reason for doing that, but if you were, are willing to only have a two year period, you could have three transitions and your sample size would be three times larger which I think would especially be worthwhile. Uh, you didn't show here, but you did a lot of subgroup analysis, which yeah. you run the risk of having too, too small a sample, especially if you have a lot of uh, 
different uh, employment states that you were, are following. Uh, that's my first comment. Uh, a second one is, uh, perhaps I'm very finicky about it, but um, I'm not sure, or let me, let me rather say, you, you make the distinction between not econo economically active and unemployed, yes. and you do find that the transitions into different states for these groups are different, but I think most of the difference in transitioning to other states is due to uh, your sample size, your your sample including really young and really old people that are, that are not economically active. The distinction between unemployed and not economically active is much smaller if, you, if you're wanting to have a kind of people, if you're wanting to limit it to men or just to, and also to people that are kind of 20 to 55 instead of 15 to 65, kind of a more people definitely not studying, not retired yet. Um, because I, I think it might be useful having less groups in, in, your, in, your, in your matrices, so, so more of a focus could be on the informally employed. Mm -hmm. You mean less groups of uh, less characteristics? Less employment states. Less, less employment six. states. Yeah. yeah. In the same vein, yeah. the, the one group is only 1%, the formally formally self-employed. Self yes, I, I would the, the perhaps consider few. throwing them with, uh, together with just uh, the formal employed. Uh, you could also be guided by descriptives with regard to the average wage or hours worked to, to decide whether you yeah. think these groups are, are close enough to, to throw together. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so in your regression, you have different sample sizes at the bottom, which uh, I'm not sure if it's the amount of people transitioning from the one state to the other one, but if it was just the sample size of a regression, it should be. Uh, regression should be on all the unemployed, so the sample size should be the same. So yeah, yeah. if it isn't sample yeah. size, uh, you might run, rerun your regressions if, if it is. Yeah, anyway, have a look at that. Well, for, for, for that one, it was the, those who, who moved. Okay, so it's, the, re, it's not regression sample size. Yes, it's those okay. who moved from, <laughs> um, yes, to other states. And a last question, sorry, yes. is with regard to uh, misclassification. Yeah. So any misreporting of state will, will make transitioning look higher than it actually is, right? Yes. Um, and I, th I think it's, even though you can't solve it, you might want to address it more directly in your paper and, and, and be open about that. Um, you, you mean misreporting in terms of uh, the employment states? Yeah, the, uh, in other states, a... yeah. So if okay, people misreport yeah. one period to the next, yeah. it might look like they transitioned, but it's just misreporting you're picking up. You, this, this was a minimal problem for, for needs. Uh, I know for the quarterly labor force, yeah, uh, yeah right. there was misreporting because of the way the questions are structured, but uh, yeah. the ones in needs are more clear. Then uh, in terms of uh, not using the, the 2010 wave, it had some problems, uh, which I addressed in my paper. Um, I don't know if you read them, but uh, and uh, uh, there was a lot of attrition as well. Yeah. I think that, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I think there might be ways around it that we can discuss, discuss yeah. later. Yeah. yeah. Oh. But, but, but thank you for, for the suggestions. And, right. uh, should and, we, yeah. should I open up to the floor? Yes, it's fine. Cool. Yeah. Is there any questions? I really like the motivation and research question and you're doing really nice descriptive work. Um, just a suggestion in terms of like moving of research forward, I think the key would be finding exogenous variation in the barriers to informal employment. And then you can start making more causal statements about uh, the effects of informal employment and then like kind of flow through effects on whether it does lead to increased formal employment and then kind of uh, make these uh, policy conclusions that you talk about at the end. Um, yeah, really nice work. Is that a just comment? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, uh, it was more a comment than a question. Um, I've come across the work of Claire Fermac. Uh, she did something a little bit similar. I've not read a paper, but I've seen a presentation by her where she splits income by different... Um, um, 
sort of lowest different categories, so like under 150, from 150 to 300, so on, and then looks at the transition, and she had a very similar breakdown, so gender, uh, education, and so on. Might be interesting to see uh, whether, I mean, if you can break it down by um, income level, or to see whether the transitions that she has are similar um, to, to what you're finding. Uh, it sounded quite uh, similar from what you were explaining. Um, so what was the name of the Claire other? Claire Fermark, um, I think she's in UKZN. Oh, I have her presentation, oh, okay, I can give okay. you that. I don't have her paper, but um, it's, it sounds like it's quite similar. And okay. she found different effects, so it would be a way to break down. Mm. We've got quite a big category of moving from unemployed to um, so that was my comment. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll have a look at the paper. Uh, I actually didn't see it when I was doing my literature review. Uh, is it recent? 2010. Uh, oh, okay. So, so it's not recent. So, okay. Got time for one more question if anyone has it. Um, so, sorry, yes, this one. Um, so, so another paper that may be interesting is uh, Norbi Makaluza wrote a paper. It's not been published yet, but it's on a it's a working paper in which she distinguishes between the different tiers of the informal sector. Right, so the, the an upper tier where the jobs are quite secure and the wages are relatively yeah. high, and then the, the lower tier where where the jobs are dangerous, insecure, the wages are low. And I think. Yeah. She finds that the, that the barriers to entry are, are quite different between those two yes. tiers, and, and probably the yeah. way that we think about them as as kind of solutions to unemployment also mm. also vary. So that may be useful also for future yes. work. Yes, yes, thank you. I actually covered that in the paper. Okay. Yes, um, draw copper threaded, and uh, uh, I mentioned that the barriers to entry are actually higher in the upper tier okay. compared to the lower tier of the in, informal. Okay. Fantastic. Informal. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Rulof discussing bridging the intention behavior gap, the effect of a plan making, the effect of plan making prompts on job search and employment. Um, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning. Uh, my name is Rulof Berger, uh, and I'll be showing you some results in a recent randomized control trial that tests the effective plan making prompts on job search and employment. It's, it's joint work with my co-authors, uh, Martin Abel, Eliana Carranza, and Patricio Pereno. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a study that was implemented on young South African job seekers. So it was a collaboration with the South African Department of Labor and JPL Africa, and it was funded by PSPPD and the World Bank's Gender Innovation Lab. <clears throat> okay, so, so what motivates this question uh, is, is the fact that we know that people fail to follow through on important intentions, right? So, so someone may, may truly intend to, to exercise more, to, to eat healthy, to, uh, to get checked for diseases, to, to vote or to submit their tax returns uh, a month before the deadline, but then something happens and their, their realized behavior is different from their intended behavior, right? So this, it creates this intention behavior gap. And it may be that people uh, reflecting back on their actual behavior regret these decisions uh, because, because their intentions really was a good indication of their, of their preferences. So, so their inability to follow through on their intentions uh, has a negative welfare effect. So, so what do we do uh, when that happens? Well, there's a sizable psychology literature that finds that, that making detailed plans and scheduling tasks can help us follow through on, on intended behavior, right? Um, so a recent literature survey by, by Todd Rogers and, and some co-authors uh, uh, enumerate a couple of hypothesized channels for why these uh, plan-making prompts may be so useful. So the, the one hypothesis is that it helps us unpack complex tasks into specific activities. So, um, so if, if something is very is is, is uh, very complicated, then then sitting down and thinking what all the steps are that you need to take, that can help us anticipate uh, uh, scheduling and logistical maybe financial constraints, uh, and it, it, it helps us be sort of goal oriented and focus on tasks that are that are actionable. The second channel is that it may help us overcoming forgetfulness and promoting recall. So. The fact that we sit down and we write down in a very detailed way what exactly, how exactly, and, and when exactly we're going to achieve uh, the desired uh, behavior 
may create environmental cues that reminds us at appropriate times that this is something that we, that we should be doing. And then thirdly, it may act as a commitment device. So, so in a vague intention to engage in some sort of behavior somewhere over the next week uh, may create less psychological pain to, to renege on that commitment than when we actually sit down and we write down specifically when we'll do this. But that, that may create a stronger commitment that's, that's more, that creates more psychological discomfort to, to, um, uh, to renege on. Um, okay, so we take the insights from the psychological literature and we ap apply it to, to job search behavior. So the question is, uh, the first question is, can plan making prompts uh, change uh, job search behavior? Uh, and and we, we test this specifically in a, in a high unemployment environment in South Africa in which job search is, is uh, uh, often passive and even when active, uh, it, there's some evidence that it's, that it's often uh, of, of a very low frequency. Um, all right, so the, the study sample is South African unemployed youths between the ages of 18 and 35. We only uh, uh, consider people who live within traveling distance from one of the three participating labor centers. All three labor centers were urban. They were, they were in, in the Gauteng province specifically. They were Soweto, uh, Krugersdorp, and, and Santon. Uh, and then we, we used the uh, Department of Labor's um, ESA database, the Employment Services of South African database of, of recently registered job seekers, and we, we uh, check which people in this database meet the requirements, and then we contact them and we invite them to one of the labor centers. About two-thirds of the people that we contacted agreed to participate, and about 64% of people that agreed to participate actually showed up, which gave us a sample of, of slightly less than uh, 1,100 participants. Um, and then they come to the, to the labor center. We collect baseline data for, for everyone. We administer the treatments. And then uh, we follow up with telephone interviews approximately five and 12, 12 weeks later. Uh, before I discuss the interventions, I just want to demonstrate, in line with what, what Rachel Glenister suggested, demonstrate to you that what we're trying to address is an actual problem rather than some theoretical problem, right? So, so our, our question is premised on this notion that there is actually an intention behavior gap for South African job seekers. And we, we investigate that by comparing uh, for the people who, who, who complete these, these plans, their, their uh, goals for certain job search behavior to how they're currently behaving or how they recently behaved. And we see that there is an intention behavior gap in the number of applications that they submit. So, so almost everyone in our sample wants to submit more applications than what they're currently submitting, but we find no intention behavior gap for the number of search hours. Most people are quite satisfied with the number of hours that they search. So, so if the plan making does what it's supposed to do, then we expect to see uh, it in, to induce change in the number of, of uh, applications, but not necessarily to have any impact on the number of job search hours, because people are, there's no intention to be a gap there. Um, okay, so what did our study look like? Well, we had three main uh, treatment arms. Uh, people were randomly assigned to, to, to one of these groups. The first is the, is the control group, obviously, and then we had a workshop basic group and a workshop plus. The workshop basic group, uh, the Department of Labor, once we started discussing the study, they were very keen for us to, to uh, evaluate the effect of the, the, the job counseling workshops that they're currently running. So that was our first treatment. Um, that it usually consists of a career counselor who's, who's trying to do this job, uh, who has these group sessions with about 20 uh, job seekers, and it lasts for about 90 minutes, and they discuss things like job search <coughs> strategies, how to create a CV, interview techniques. Um, uh, and then the third treatment arm, which is the one that I'm going to be focusing on, is, is what we call the workshop plus. So, so uh, individuals who are allocated to that group go through the normal workshop, but then subsequently we hand them a plan template and we invite them to create a personal job search plan. Um, so, so we ask them to write down, uh, preferably in, in, in some detail, the how, the when, and the where of job search for a typical week. Uh, so this is what one completed uh, action plan looks like. So people receive this action plan. As you can see, uh, it, it's got all the days of the week in there. We, it's, we, we, we um, uh, um, specify that this, they should fill this in uh, at how they want to behave in a specific week. And then we ask them to, to say, which time of the day do you want to engage in some activity? What activity is it in this, in this uh, third column? and then to add some details about that. Uh, the, the literature shows that the more detailed uh, you add to the action plan, the more effective it is. It also shows that 
you want the goals to be ambitious but not unrealistic. In fact, in the pilot, we found that usually if we, if we gave someone this, they would, they would feel obliged to, to enter some activity for each of the seven days. And we had to encourage them not to do that, to, to make plans that are, that are realistic, otherwise um, uh, they won't be achievable. We also asked people to, to specify the number of job opportunities they want to identify, uh, the number of applications they want to submit, and the, and the number of hours. Um, okay, we also had two sub-treatments. Um, so so uh, a random subset of the Workshop Plus group uh, was asked to identify a peer who can help them follow through on their intentions with the consent of the, of the participants. Uh, we then contacted the peer with information about the personal job search goals and then we had a, a reminder sub-treatment. So for each of the treatment arms we sent weekly reminders to the, to the uh, participants uh, reminding them to, to, to follow through on their intentions. So uh, not to get too far ahead of myself but, but uh, none of the sub-treatments were found to, to have any significant effect on behavior or in outcomes. So our main specification pools across these, these sub-treatments. I'll, I'll, I'll briefly discuss uh, the, the, the results that, that allow for uh, the sub-treatments to also have an effect and to, and to um, discuss how we interpret those results. All right, so the, the, first, but it was, uh, the, the first table I want to show you is the effect of uh, action planning on uh, job search intensity. So what we have here is the, the effect of the Workshop Basic and the Workshop Plus group on the number of search hours and on the number of applications submitted. And what we see is that neither the Workshop Basic nor the Workshop Plus has any significant impact on the number of search hours, uh, but, and whereas the Workshop Basic doesn't really have any significant effect on the number of applications, the Workshop Plus certainly does. Uh, people who participate in the, in the Workshop Plus, the action plan, uh, are able to submit significantly more applications than their counterparts who, who just attended the workshop, the basic workshop. Uh, the, the, the effect so, so people in the Workshop Basic, uh, uh, workshop, base, uh, workshop Plus uh, treatment arm tend to submit about 15% more applications than their counterparts in the, in the Workshop Basic group, which, which narrows but doesn't completely uh, uh, eliminate the, the intention behavior gap. Um, we also did a, so, so these are self-reported uh, applications, so obviously you're always going to be concerned that people might be misreporting the number of applications. So we ran an additional experiment in which we anonymously contacted them and, and, and told them about this uh, job opportunity, and we had them apply to, to an email account that we created, and that allowed us to observe whether people actually applied or not, and the treatment effects that we get for the different groups uh, are very similar to the ones that we show here. So it, it seems like this result isn't driven by people who are, who are falsely reporting applying for jobs. Um, we also, we also initially we were we had some qualms that the search hour uh, variable may be may be soft that people maybe won't remember exactly how many search hours they, they engaged in, but it does correspond quite sensibly to to the search channels, uh, and also we're we're kind of reassured the, by the fact that um, these effects all seem to be quite precise zeros. In no case is any of the coefficients more than 3.5 percent uh, of the of the control mean. Um, okay, so that's the first result. It seems like, like, as if these plan-making prompts can actually induce changes in search behavior, right? And, and it, can, it can allow people to increase the number of applications they submit with no corresponding increase in, in the number of hours that they search, right? So, so it seems like the action plans lead to a, 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 an improved search efficiency. Uh, people tend to, it's, we, we assume, reallocate time away from activities that have a very low probability of, of producing an application and towards other kinds of act activities that, that have a higher probability of, of leading to an application. So the next question is, um, well, even if people change their behavior, would we expect a change in search behavior to have any impact on employment outcomes in this high unemployment context which, where, where employment is clearly demand constrained? Uh, and what we see is, is that it, it, uh, that does seem to be the case. So, in this table, I show you the, the effect of the treatments on the number of employer responses, the number of job offers, and the probability of being employed uh, in the follow-up waves. And what we see is that the workshop basic doesn't, uh, doesn't really seem to have any significant or consistent effect of increasing employment outcomes, but the workshop plus does. Uh, the workshop plus significantly increases the number of employer responses, the number of job offers, and the probability of being employed. And when compared to the workshop basic, the, 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 the improvement in the employment outcomes is, is fairly consistent. So the workshop plus improves 
the number of employer responses by 24% by relative to the workshop basic, by 30% uh, uh, in terms of, of, of uh, job offers, and by 26% in terms of the employment probability, right? So, so the, the pattern seems to be quite consistent, and we see the effects of, of plan making in all of these different links of the causal chain. Um, and it seems, this seems to suggest that, that the action plan doesn't only lead to an increase in search efficiency, that people change their behavior, but it also leads to an increase in search effectiveness, uh, which suggests that the, that the returns to, to job search in South Africa is, may actually be high, which is a, a result that I found quite surprising. Um, so why does this happen? How can people, by changing their, their behavior without increasing the search hours, actually improve their search outcomes and the, and the, or the, the, the labor outcomes and the, and the number of applications? Well, we look at the, we specifically ask people to, to tell us how frequently, they, how frequently they engage in different search channels. Um, how frequently they visit employment agencies, uh, how frequently did they drop off CVs, place <coughs> ads, answered ads, searched online, or contacted family and friends. And what we see is that the, the Workshop Plus had no effect on the frequency with which they contacted family or friends, or with which they placed ads, but it did increase the frequency with which they visited employment agencies, dropped off CVs, answered ads, and searched online. So, so <laughs> why would that uh, reallocation of, of search channels have, um, uh, have a positive effect, and, and uh, why would uh, planning prompts have uh, induced that, that change in behavior. Well, it seems to us that the, that the channels that respond to the action plan are different from the channels that don't in at least two ways. Firstly, they tend to be more complex. So phoning a friend or placing an ad saying, I need work, it doesn't really require very many steps. You don't need to get all the documentation and fill in an application and go visit a, 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 a place of employment, uh, as opposed to visiting an employment agency, dropping off a CV, uh, answer, uh, answering an ad or searching online, right? So, so in terms of the number of steps, it, it could be that those channels are very high return, very effective, but people tend not to use them as much as they should because they're complex and, and in the absence of an action plan, people don't get around to, to using them. The second way in which they're different is, is we think that they're probably higher cost, both in terms of, of traveling cost, uh, uh, traveling time and traveling uh, monetary cost, but also maybe in terms of the psychological cost uh, and that there's a chance of a face-to-face -face rejection, right? So if I place an ad or I tell my family and friends they should look out for a job, there's no chance that I'll, be, that, that, that I'll face rejection, whereas um, going to visiting an employment agency, answering an ad, dropping off a CV, all of these things may be costly in the, in the near run which, which means people with a present bias may, may be disinclined to use them as much as they, as they would. And our interpretation of this results is that, um, that people in equilibrium, uh, without action planning prompts, people tend to underinvest in these high returning, but also high cost and complex search channels, and they do so uh, to the detriment of their, of their employment outcomes. Um, all right, so that leaves us with, with a bit, bit of a puzzle, which is, um, uh, why don't people use these, uh, um, why, why did participants fail to optimize job search in the, action, in the, in the absence of an of a, of a, um, action plan, and why do these action plans work? Now, I should say our experimental design uh, really wasn't designed to, to answer these questions conclusively, and I don't think we have the evidence to, to, to kind of... Uh, uh, to, to have the final word as to why they're effective, but I do think some of these subtreatment results are quite interesting, and we and we uh, we think they're suggestive of, of possibly what what uh, why action plans work. So the the first result is that uh, we find that participants in the peer support subtreatment reported engaging with peers, and they reported finding them helpful, but they showed no significant difference in search behavior or employment outcomes. So something about this peer support commitment mechanism which has been shown to be quite effective in other domains, that, that doesn't seem to, to have a, a large effect in, in, in our study. Secondly, the SMS reminders about job search goals, we find that has no significant effect on behavioral outcomes, and it doesn't seem to be because people are ignoring them. So if, if we ask people uh, whether they remember their search goals, for example, the people who, who received reminders about their search goals say that they, they can remember them better. So it does seem people as if people are, are receiving these SMSs and paying attention to them. But even, even individuals who were in the workshop basic group showed no increased inclination to change, to, to, to increase search intensiveness or to have better employment outcomes when receiving these, these uh, weekly reminders. So, so we think that's, that's maybe consistent with, with uh, 
a process in which forgetfulness isn't a binding constraint uh, for these job seekers. What we do find is a strong positive association between the stated goals uh, in, in, uh, that people uh, formulate for themselves when they make plans and the change in behavior. So people who are very ambitious that they wanted to search more hours, uh, we see that effect in their subsequent behavior. They do tend to increase the number of hours that they search without that having an impact on the number of applications. Whereas individuals who, who were more ambitious in terms of the number of hours or the number of applications that they wanted to submit, those individuals do effectively increase the number of, of applications that they submit with no corresponding effect on the, on the number of search hours. So, so our interpretation of that is that, that certainly we think this result uh, points to plan, the effective plan making operating through the fact that it allows people to unpack these complex tasks and to focus on goal uh, directed actions rather than because it works by a reminder or by a, a, a commitment. Okay, uh, so just to conclude, we find that prompting young South Africans to make concrete and specific plans makes them more likely to act on job search intentions. They, they submit more applications when they make these plans and they make use of more complex and costlier search channels. Uh, and we find that this change in behavior results in increased employment uh, and an increased employment likelihood. Thank you. Yes, Carson, this is wrong. Oh. Sorry, I've got it wrong, right, sorry. Because it's good to discuss and it's good, sorry. Right, thank you. I found this to be a very insightful uh, paper, considering that the effect of active level market programs, it's uh, quite marginal. And uh, this, this, this paper actually showed that uh, including uh, the, this kind of initiative would uh, would actually be complementary to, to, to how ALMPs uh, uh, are functioning. Um, uh, when I was reading your paper, I was really interested on the impact of uh, peer, uh, peer support and uh, accountability. I actually thought uh, the result would be significant, uh, considering you know, uh, much literature on, on, on accountability, but uh, <clears throat> could it be that uh, um, by just being part of this program, the participants just being part of this program, could it be that uh, they already uh, felt accountable to, to the implementers of the program? Uh, so the, the, the impact of uh, another peer or, or SMSs uh, would, would be very minimal. Um, you also mentioned that uh, the, the positive employment effects of plan making uh, didn't come at the cost of uh, um, um, applying to or, or, or being offered lower quality jobs. Um, um, it could it also be that the, since the search strategies were more effective, uh, um, participants we were also more likely to, uh, to, to apply into to, to formal jobs that, that require more formal recruitment procedures and uh, that's why the quality was not uh, was not compromised com compared to other jobs, which are mostly informal, that uh, uh, that re that that require the use of social networks. But um, <clears throat> those are questions. Um, and uh, I know that you did not show this in your paper, but uh, <laughs> did you um, did you, as part of your results, did you uh, figure out if the the jobs were were formal, or, or from the start they were formal. Was that your, uh, <clears throat> was that the area you're looking into that they were strictly formal jobs? Um, so, but basically, I found this really interesting, and uh, I think the South African government should, you know, um, look into this to to reduce youth unemployment. Thank you. Uh, Jay, do you want me to respond to those questions? Do you want to respond? Yeah, let's go. Uh, okay, so, so I agree. I, I was very enthusiastic about the peer support mechanism, um, and I was surprised that it, it didn't have an effect. I, I think, I think your, uh, your explanation is consistent with, with the data. So, so if, the, if the action plan on its own already creates a very firm commitment mechanism, then maybe it's not surprising that the, that the peer support doesn't have any additional commitment effect, right? I think that's yeah, consistent yeah. with the data. Um, in terms of the reminders, I think the surprising thing is that the reminders 
uh, didn't have any impact on the workshop basic. So, so that, I think, suggests that, that, um, that forgetfulness isn't the reason why the, the people in the workshop basic group aren't behaving in the way that they want to behave and not achieving the outcomes they want to, they want to achieve. Um, in terms of the, the effect of job quality, um, so, so we do have some data on, on job quality and we, we, we did some analysis. We didn't find any effects on the, on the, the, uh, uh, on the, on the quality of the jobs that people found. But admittedly, um, it's, it's quite a small share of individuals in our sam sample who, who transitioned into employment. So, so we prefer not to push that story. I, I don't think, um, um, so, so there's no indication from the data that, that there, was a, there was a large increase or a decrease in in the wages or the probability of, of, of uh, self-employment or informal sector employment, but, but I think the results are probably too imprecise for us to, to kind of say that very, uh, that, that there's definitely the effect is exactly zero. Uh, but, th but there's no indication that, uh, that it leads to more informal sector jobs. It could well be that, that you're right, that, that an increased inclination to use these formal search channels, which results in more formal sector jobs, that, that, that uh, certainly wouldn't be inconsistent with, with the data. Thank you. Questions from the floor? Uh, can we start from that side and then we'll... Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I was, I was just wondering about, the, um, because the, the peer support versus uh, what's going on here, there's, there's another difference, which is the, the, the peers maybe have the same information as, as, as I have. So it may be going to the nitty-gritty of actually how the, the program was implemented, but could it be that, that they also got uh, personal, more personalized or more detailed feedback to what their plan was than in what, you know, a, a, a regular workshop would be? Yes, I, um, I think it's a, a really exciting and, and fun paper. Um, so, a couple of things. I think the first was, would you agree with the conclusion that this um, suggests job seekers aren't at the budget constraint because there's a bunch of other work in like Addis Ababa and other places suggesting that that is a meaningful constraint on search. Um, and then just in terms of other mechanisms, which is a hard thing to say after an experiment because there's not much you can do. But um, I wondered if it was a little bit about, possibly about poor information about the returns to search and if you were putting information um, in the treatment arms um, or a sort of framing or salience effect if um, you're focusing uh, individuals on those couples of out couple of outcomes. Um, and I guess the, the final thing was just, I, th I think from, from the presentation that um, you allow people to set their own goals. So as I understand that means you, um, it, it could be that the goals are inaccurate or it could be that you're, um, you're getting people to set plans. Um, so, you know, it may be that people have a too low a reference point for uh, how many applications they should submit, or it could be that they're going through the, the process of making a plan. I don't think you can distinguish them, um, but it might just be interesting to uh, think if there are any ways you, you could. Uh, do you want to respond first? Or let me, let me respond to those and we can see whether we get more time. So, so in terms of the, um, the way in which the peers help, um, so, so you're right. We, we can't we, we can't say whether whether other peers that, that are better informed may have may have helped. So, so certainly in the, in the qualitative interviews we did subsequently, it seems as if people found the peers to be useful. Uh, we have a section in the paper that discussed the ways in which they were useful. So, they they uh, I think they they sometimes provided monetary support. They they uh, uh, people experienced that support as being useful. Uh, but but whatever the support was, it it, it, it didn't really affect the, the outcome. So. Um, in terms of the budget constraint, I mean, I, th I think you're right. I think the evidence certainly suggests that, that not everyone is, is kind of uh, meeting, is, is, is uh, facing a binding budget constraint. Uh, because I do think some of the channels that they turn to are, are more costly than what they're, what they're doing at the moment. So, so I, I think that's probably, probably true. In terms of information effects, the, the, I think the workshop basic certainly introduces more information, right? That's, that's a large part of what it's designed to do. But I can't think of any any information that, that's being introduced, uh, any additional information that's being introduced by the, by the uh, workshop plus. Um, so, so that's why we, I, I don't think that's something that we, that we uh, considered. I don't know whether you can think of, of reasons where there would be more information that, that we couldn't. Um, 
And then um, in terms of setting the goals, yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to, to think about that. Maybe we can discuss that afterwards. I don't have a, I don't have a good answer for exactly, um, yeah, exactly what's going on there. Thanks. Really, really interesting paper, and I'm, I'm working on something similar, and I'd love to get your thoughts on cool. how we're doing it uh, after the presentation. Um, so, so my first question is just to get a, a little bit more information about the demographics. So in terms of, like, how much do you think that these are people that are selecting in, and how much does that affect the generalizability? So if you're already opting in to kind of do your job search, how, how much do we think that this would be applied to others? Um, also, in terms of the search costs, it, it seemed like they were in a specific location that was close to the job centers, yeah. and maybe that could actually address some of the questions that you were talking about, the cost of job, the budgetary constraints of job search. And I just, and I'd be really interested, are these, like, where, would, where do these, got, these people fit within the socioeconomic spectrum? Are they, are they in what quintile are they in? Um, the more substantive question around the intervention is, I'd be really curious to know, do you think that this is like a situational thing that they do, where they're kind of, their general, like, non-cog skills don't change at all, you just give them something to help, like, almost like a synthetic improvement in their non-cog skill that's very temporary and just affects this particular domain? Or do you think that, like, going through this process actually makes them think about pl implementing plans, goal setting, in a new light, and then once they enter into the jobs, not only do they, are they more effective at getting that job, but they may actually apply those, those, those behaviors and have like very long-term, uh, or potentially lo longer-term effects. Um, so I'd be curious if there's, so one way to measure that, for example, would be to look at like c conscientiousness. Um, if you don't see a change in conscientiousness, <coughs> clearly it's a synthetic change. If you do, then maybe that there's actually like, uh, like changes that follow on. In, in yeah. Um, okay, so so there are some descriptive statistics from the paper on the on some of the attributes of this of this group. So, um, so it certainly isn't a representative sample of, of South African uh, of the South African unemployed. Uh, they're not quite at the front of the job queue because they there are uh, we we don't have people in here with university qualifications. Uh, they're, they're quite young, uh, and, and we know uh, the, the the youth have our unemployment rate. Um, but they're also not, not exactly at the back of the job, job queue because they're urban, uh, they're, they're relatively um, motivated because they're actually registered at the, at the job center and they were willing to come in and, and, uh, and discuss job search strategies. So we think they're, they're probably gonna, not a quite representative group, not quite at the front and not quite at the back of the, of the job queue. Um, in terms of how the effects we generalize to, to people at other positions in the job queue, I think it could go either way, right? So, so on the one hand, the fact that these guys are urban, relatively well uh, educated means that the change in their behavior is probably more likely to have an have a effect on employment outcomes than for someone who's, who's in a rural area with, with, with lower levels of human capital. At the same time, I think, um, I think in those areas, you're probably more likely to see uh, discouragement in job search activity and, and maybe in those areas the, the effect of the action plan on search behavior will be stronger than what we see here. So um, it's not something that we're in a position to, to, to answer conclusively but, but, but I think it could, it could probably go uh, either way. Um, uh, and then in terms of the Non-cognitive skills, so we certainly think of this intervention as, as not changing human capital, not changing the way in which people can signal human capital, and just changing uh, their, their search behavior. Um, can I rule out the fact that it maybe changes non-cognitive skills? I, I guess I can't, um, but it, it would be surprising if, if spending 10 minutes doing an action plan permanently changes non-cognitive skills in a way that, that they can then signal to employers to the extent that they, that they increase their, their likelihood of, of becoming employed, right? I, th I think you're right. I think down the line, maybe they learn something from action planning that will make them more productive in, in the workplace, but I doubt that they, that they can kind of leverage that change in non-cognitive non skills, is, if it exists, to explain the increase in employment uh, outcomes. Uh, but that's not something that we've looked at. Something, it's certainly something that I'll spend some more time thinking about. Did that, did that cover all your questions? Yeah, no, that was great. Okay. great. Thanks, man. All right. Cool. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, next, we have Rob discussing job search and matching with two-sided limited information. Great. Thanks very much for, to everyone for coming out here. This is a joint project with several co-authors, one of whom is at the World Bank, and so I'm obliged to tell you that her views are represented here, but the directors of the World Bank are not. I don't think we're going to say anything that would make them unhappy, but just to be clear, don't quote us on this. 
We're going to study a, a widespread phenomenon that is occurring in many developing and a small number of developed countries, which is a very high and rising rate of youth unemployment. This has direct negative consequences for the youth if we think that this is involuntary unemployment. And there's a long series of evidence suggesting that there are long-term economic consequences of this. So young people who experience prolonged periods of unemployment or low wages experience scarring effects that change their subsequent employment and earnings trajectories throughout their lives. And there's a variety of evidence showing that youth unemployment is correlated with higher rates of crime and political instability, some of which suggests that there might potentially be a causal relationship. So we think that this is a very important problem with very major welfare implications. It's consistent with a long list of economic models. We're not going to try and say that there is one true economic model that is generating this, but we're going to focus on one specific friction that can generate the high rates of youth unemployment that we see in a variety of countries, which is limited information about work seeker skills. So the core idea here is that work seekers have some sort of scalar or vector level of productivity and skills, and it might be difficult for the work seekers to observe those skills and for employers to observe those skills. So the economic environment that we'd like you to think about is one where there is a set of work seekers and a set of firms. The firms have heterogeneous productivity, the work seekers have heterogeneous skills. There is some friction in the labor market that means that either hiring or firing is costly. So this might be a law that makes it difficult to fire people. It might be that it's expensive to hire and train new people. Or there might be a minimum wage. And this minimum wage could be zero. It could just be the case that you can't pay workers less than zero. And combining this with a limited ability to observe work seeker skills, we're going to have some work seekers whose value added to firms is lower than the minimum wage they're allowed to pay them, <coughs> accounting for firing or hiring costs. So they're basically going to be a set of people whose value to the labor market is such that they don't get hired as a result of this information friction combined with some of these other characteristics. And we think that these other characteristics are a very realistic description of many economies around the world. What is this going to do? It's going to distort search and hiring choices in a variety of ways. I'm not going to be very precise about what those are, because depending on exactly how you write down the model, you can generate predictions where this will increase search effort, where this will decrease search effort, and we'll do a variety of different things under different parameterizations. What it will do, generally in all of these types of models, is reduce total employment and reduce total earnings. So the presence of these frictions means that fewer people get jobs, and the total wage bill that are paid out to workers is lower. These distortions are going to be highest where skills are hardest to observe. And we're going to argue that that's particularly true for young work seekers. So if you're a young work seeker who doesn't have an established set of work experience in which you've learned about your own skills and in which you're able to signal those skills to firms by using reference letters from past employers or by just showing that you have a job track record, you're going to be hurt most by these distortions. It's not the case that work seekers who have the lowest skills are going to have the most distorted employment outcomes. Depending on exactly how you specify the model, it can be the case that work seekers with very high skills have the biggest drop in employment as a result of these frictions, or work seekers with lowest skills. That's not something that follows from the model, but that's something we can look at in data. What I would also say is this is a particularly compelling description of the world in cases where we think that the education system doesn't provide a very strong signal to firms of what work seeker skills are. So in the specific context we're going to work in, there's a low measured correlation between formal years of schooling and cognitive skills assessments in literacy or numeracy. And that's true in a wide variety of countries. So we've seen in a lot of countries, there's a, a, effectively a situation where people are passing through the education system, but the years of education that they attain don't accurately reflect the amount they've learned. And that makes it difficult for employers to trust signals that are uh, basically to trust years of education as a signal of productivity. So what we're going to do in this study is experimentally manipulate the information that work seekers and firms observe about work seeker skills. And what comes out of the economic framework we're thinking about is that we should see an increase in the accuracy of beliefs about skills. So work seekers should have better information about their skills and have more accurate beliefs. There should be changes in job search behavior, but it's not the case that those are necessarily going to be positive or negative. It could go in either direction. And we should see an increase in employment and earnings. The heterogeneity across different types of work seekers with different skill levels can tell us something about the specific design of the model. I'm not going to talk much about this today, but that's something that as we go forward, we're going to be writing up a little bit more formally. We're going to study urban South Africa, which is a context with extremely high youth unemployment, depending on how you think about discouraged workers. It could be as high as up to 70% unemployment amongst young people. It's going to be a setting where formal education is weakly correlated with measured skills. And when you talk to firms anecdotally, they report that they struggle to assess the skills of young work seekers. We're going to look at a sample of young people in their 20s. They've completed high school and come from a disadvantaged background. That's difficult to define in this context, 
but broadly you should think of this as not a group of people who are coming from wealthy families. They're actively searching for work and they don't have a prior history of formal employment. So many of them have done some sort of work before, but they haven't held a formal salaried job ever. We're gonna assess new work seeker skills in six domains. Numeracy is exactly what it sounds like. Communication is gonna assess both their oral and written communication skills. Concept formation is a test that is effectively going to be a measure of ability to learn. It's, the psychologists tell me it's something a little bit more complicated. I think roughly speaking, you can think of this as how well people are able to learn. Grit is a fairly standard survey-based measure, essentially measuring how long people stick at difficult tasks and how willing they are to keep working when there are, diff when there are low returns. And then these are two behavioral economics tasks, one of which basically measures people's ability to focus on a specific task and tune out distractions and the other measures people's ability to think and plan ahead so that they can solve a problem which, if they dive straight into without planning, is very difficult to solve. So we have these six assessments, and we're then gonna randomly assign work seekers who've completed these assessments to one of three treatment arms. One is a control group, that's a group of work seekers who take these assessments and then get no information about their assessment results. The second is what we call a private treatment group, which is a group of work seekers who take the assessments and then get information about their assessment results in a way that is difficult for them to share with firms. And I'll be precise about what that means in a moment. And our third treatment group is a public group which is gonna receive feedback on their assessment results in a way that is easy to share with firms. So the core idea is that comparing the control and private groups tells us the effect of eliminating supply side information friction. So giving work seekers alone better information about their skills. Comparing the private and public groups tells us the additional effect of allowing those work seekers to signal those skills to firms. This is not directly changing the information sets firms have, it's giving work seekers the option of changing the information set firms have. So it's possible that work seekers, particularly those who obtain low assessment results, may not choose to share these results with firms. So this, is, this comparison is gonna capture a mix of alleviating demand side information frictions, but also the endogenous choices about work seekers for work seekers about what information to convey. So let's be precise about what we say when, we're gonna, when we tell you they can share information with firms. Each work seeker is gonna get a report like this. We've removed the name of our partner. As you can see, we spent a lot of our budget on graphic design. We have very professionally blacked out little things there. Um, and basically, they're gonna be able to see that this has been in some way conducted by the World Bank and by a partner who has a relatively well-known brand in South Africa and who employers have a good chance of recognizing. They're gonna tell the, uh, employers that work seekers have been assessed on these six different skills, a little bit about what those skills are, a website they can go to to get more information about the skills, including seeing what the actual assessments are, and then they're gonna be told which tercile on each of these skills the employer falls into, and what the reference group is for, um, someone here, there's gonna be a reference group which says this is the set of work seekers against, this per against which this person is being assessed. So this is not saying they scored eight out of 10 on numeracy, because when we piloted, firms have absolutely no clue what that means without seeing the detailed numeracy test. These are all gonna be relative measures of performance. So that's what happens to people in the public group. They get 30 of these reports, and they get the option of coming back to us to get more reports, and they get the report emailed to them. People in the private group get exactly the same information, word for word, but there's no branding by the World Bank or our partner, and the work seeker's name and ID number, which are in the public report, are not on the private report. There's nothing over there. So work seeker in the private group could share this report with firms, but it's gonna have a much, much lower level of credibility because it's not clearly linked to the work seeker and it doesn't have this branding back yet up. So we're gonna survey work seekers twice, once three to four months after the intervention, and once 10 to 12 months after the intervention. We're gonna survey them about their beliefs about their own skills and their beliefs about the labor market more broadly. We're gonna survey them about their search effort and search effectiveness. Search effort means things like how many applications did you submit as in rule of study. Search effectiveness means things like what is the share, the ratio of job offers you received to applications you submitted as a measure of how well those are working. And we're gonna survey people about their employment status, so are they employed now and how many hours are they working, and their employment, quote unquote, quality, which means things like what are their wages, what are their total earnings, is it a formal job, and are they happy with the job? Today, we're gonna to talk only about the three to four month follow-up. This is just finished. Results are gonna be here soon, but we haven't actually analyzed the data yet. We're gonna estimate very simple linear regression models to estimate treatment effects. We're gonna regress outcomes on an indicator for being in the private treatment group and the public treatment group, a vector of stratification block fixed effects, and a vector of baseline controls, which we select using a modified lasso, which is a machine learning technique designed to tell us which variables strongly predict the outcome 
and kind of belong in the regression model to absorb a lot of the variation in the outcome. We're going to cluster standard errors at the unit at which treatment was assigned, which in this case is the day. The, all of the people who showed up to get assessed on a particular day got the same treatment status. We're going to aggregate outcomes into what are called family-level indices. So the core idea there is we're going to have a lot of different measures of beliefs. We could test whether there's a treatment effect on every single measure of beliefs, but the risk is you're going to get some false positives, and you'll see some treatment effects even if all of them are truly zero. So what we're going to do is take an inverse covariance weighted average of all of those measures and estimate if that inverse covariance weighted average has a treatment effect. If there is, then we can break it down and start looking at individual components of that index to understand exactly where it's happening. So I'm going to mainly today talk about aggregate indices, except for employment, where I'm going to dig down into specific outcomes as well. All of this stuff so far is pre-specified. There'll be one graph at the end that is not pre-specified in a pre-analysis plan, but all of this so far is in a pre-analysis -pre plan on the American Economic Association's website. So what do we find? Let's start out by looking at this first column here, which is beliefs about own skills. These are effect, treatment effects on indices of beliefs about own skills. And what this is telling us is that the public treatment group increases the accuracy of beliefs about own skills by 0.7 standard deviations. So this is a very large effect. And you'll see from the R-squared, we actually explain a fairly substantial portion of the variation in accuracy of beliefs with this treatment. The private treatment group increases accuracy of beliefs by a little bit over half a standard deviation, and these are statistically significantly different to each other, and both jointly significantly different to zero. So we see a very large effect on accuracy of beliefs about own skills. We see a little bit of action on beliefs about returns to search, which is basically a measure of what do people think the probability of getting a job is conditional on submitting different numbers of applications. We see pretty precisely estimated zeros on the beliefs about what they think they might earn in the labor market, how much search effort they put in, and how effective their search is. We do see a substantial effect of the public treatment on employment status. So they're much more likely to be employed. And when we break that down into specific employment outcomes, we see that the public treatment increases the probability of having a job by about 5 percentage points, off a base of about 30 percentage points. So it's a 17% increase in employment, which is large. The probability of having worked at any point since they were treated three to four months ago is similarly high. And basically, if we look at month-by-month -month employment, we see a big jump in employment in the first month after treatment, which declines a tiny bit in months two and three, but basically stays constantly very different to zero. They increase the number of hours they work. And if we break down employment quality, we see that there's a large increase in earnings, a little bit of an increase in wages, because hours increase less than earnings, and we calculate wages from earnings over hours, and no movement in probability of having a written permanent contract and actually a slight decrease in the probability of wanting to stay in the current job. So we see some stuff suggesting that earnings are going up, but the biggest margin of effect seems to be this increase in the probability of actually being employed. We can decompose the earnings effect into three margins, the effect on employment, which I've already shown you, the effect on the earnings of inframarginal workers. So if you were going to get a job anyway without treatment, your earnings might be changed by treatment. And the third margin, which is the level of the earnings that people who are induced into employment by the treatment have. We've set up an econometric method to decompose these, and it looks like most of the effect is this third one. So it looks like our inframarginal workers, the people who are getting jobs anyway, are not earning more because of treatment. It's basically as they were getting more people into employment who are now earning something rather than zero. I want to show two measures of heterogeneity very briefly, which speak to some of the discussion we had at the beginning. The first is heterogeneity by skill. So this is an aggregate index that combines the different skills measures together. And what we then do is estimate a non-parametric regression of employment status. So did you work in the last seven days, which is our primary measure of employment? We estimate that non-parametrically against the skills index, separately for the public treatment group, the private treatment group, and the control group. And so at each level of skill, this tell, the gap between these lines tells us the treatment effect for work seekers with that specific skill level. And I think the main take home you want to get away from this is that there isn't evidence of a massively increasing or decreasing treatment effect as the skills index increases. So it's not the case that there's huge heterogeneity by skills, particularly if we compare public and private, sorry, uh, public and control, there's a suggestion that maybe in this middle tercile of skills, the treatment effect is largest, but it's certainly not statistically significantly different. We also construct an index of people's probability to be employed using a method that was proposed a few years ago. And basically the take home from this is that the probability of being employed, of actually being employed, is increasing in your predicted level of employment. That's not a shock. It's not a purely statistical artifact. That doesn't have to be the case, but it turns out sensibly that it is. But we don't see that there's a dramatic difference in 
the level of in the level of employment for the public treatment group versus the control group across the latent probability of employment. So it doesn't seem to be the case that this treatment is having a very different effect in people who have a good chance of getting jobs versus a bad chance of getting jobs. It seems to be a moderate increase throughout the distribution. So what we see here basically is a set of experimental results that are consistent with information frictions, primarily on the demand side, primarily about firms not being able to observe work seeker skills perfectly. This doesn't rule out the possibility of supply side frictions. It is possible that these employment changes we see are being driven by changes in work seeker search behavior in a way that we don't, don't measure in our survey. And the specific possibility that might come up is maybe work seekers search much harder in the public treatment group just after treatment. They experience that big bump in employment in that first month after treatment, which they keep, and by the end of month three, we no longer see a large treatment effect on search effort. We're not able to separate that out, so this isn't a perfect test for demand side frictions ahead of supply side, but it looks a lot more like demand than supply side. What we're doing next is doing a uh, 10 to 12 month follow-up survey, as we said, and we're also working to separately identify treatment effects, heterogeneity, by skill versus information shock. So what's happening in this diagram over here is that people in this upper tercile have higher skills, which might influence the treatment effect on them, but they're also more likely to get positive information from the treatment because they're told that their skills are higher. This graph doesn't try and separate those out, and we're developing a set of tools that are designed to separately identify those two effects, which will tell us a little bit more about whether this is kind of essential heterogeneity by skills or heterogeneity in the way in which we've assessed the treatment. So looking forward to any suggestions or comments you have on that. Obviously, this can be taken into account a lot in the way we analyze stuff forward. Thank you. The discussion is rule of. Thanks, Rob. I, I, um, uh, I really like the paper, so I think, I think it's interesting. I think it's important work. Um, I think the interventions that you tested are cleverly designed. Uh, I know your, your social partner has been singing your praises. They, they really feel, um, to anyone who's willing to listen, that you've helped them understand their business, and, and I think that's fantastic. Um, certainly, I look forward to, to, to the, the insights that will be um, that you'll be able to gain from the new data. One of the things, personally, that I think is, is great about this data is um, so. So, uh, uh, one of the comments that we always get from our reference data study is that those a reference data is really only useful for someone who's worked before, and I think you demonstrate that there is signaling things that you can do to help people with with, with no previous employment uh, signal, and I think that's I think that's very exciting from a policy perspective and, and from uh, helping us understand the labor market. So obviously I'm going to focus on, on some things that, that I would have liked to, to have seen in the paper. So, so the, the first issue is your interpretation of the two treatment effects, right? So in the introduction, certainly you, you, you lean towards interpreting the, the control versus private as, as uh, kind of re the, the resolution of, of supply side information frictions as opposed to the, the public versus private, which, which uh, gives you an indication of the resolution of demand side uh, uh, information frictions and the perception that they'll be resolved. Um, and, I, and I think there are two things that, that, that would help me kind of um, find that more persuasive. The first one is uh, a discussion about, about why it is that the, that the public treatment seems to have a larger effect on belief updating than the private one, right? So, so, um, so in my mind, you know, I think maybe, maybe if the public treatment is more credible or more memorable, uh, then, then that, has, that seems to have a larger, a larger effect on, on people's own beliefs. But that would seem to imply that the, that the private intervention uh, doesn't lead to a complete updating of beliefs. And, and if that's the case, then maybe some of those supply side frictions being resolved seeps into the, into the public treatment as well, right? Uh, and, the, and the second point that, that uh, if you have any information on whether anyone in the private treatment actually tried to take this, this non-logoed uh, thing, photocopy it and including it uh, in, their, in, their, um, uh, in their applications. I have no reason to think that they would, but, but it's, it's not inconceivable that, that some people may have thought that the, that the private intervention would have been useful and that some firms may have responded to that. So if you can demonstrate that that's not happening, or at least happening very rarely, I think that would make it clear that the, the public, public versus private treatment is, is capturing this demand side. Um, rather than some of that effect also being in the, in the, in the uh, private treatment. Um, so the, 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 your result that, that, the, that neither treatment really affects the, the job search, I think, is, is interesting, particularly because you find that, that the public treatment increases the expected returns to job search, but then you find no effect on actual job search, right, which is, which is interesting. Um, so so I'm, I'm concerned that, that, that 
well, it, it would be great to, to, to maybe see some of the disaggregated regressions for the different job search categories, just to make sure that the effect isn't in there, but it's, uh, you're not seeing it. If you have any information on search channels, I think that would be useful. And then on a, rela a related note, I haven't come across this, this family indexing thing. I think, I think the method is, is a very uh, elegant and, and, um, and sophisticated solution to, to an important problem. But I do worry that, that if the underlying process is, is actually multidimensional, rather than, than one latent variable producing all these noisy realizations uh, that, you, that you put into a family, what, what is the effect of that? If, if, if job search is actually two-dimensional uh, and you're trying to model it as a, as a, as a single latent variable, what, what happens to your measure then? And also, if the, if the variables that you include in the job search uh, uh, family include things like any search activity loss uh, in, the, in the previous 30 days, 7 days, I was spent searching, if, if a bunch of those things are very highly correlated, would that kind of drown out the, the contribution of, of maybe slightly uh, less uh, uh, correlated uh, variables like the, the number of applications, for example? So, so I don't understand these techniques used, uh, very well, but, but some discussion would have been useful. Then uh, three last things that uh, some information on the dynamic effects would have been useful. So, so it seems from your disaggregated results as if the, the private and the public treatment effects are very similar initially, both in terms of belief updating and employment, and then they diverge. So, so having a sense of whether the, the public treatment is, is uh, stronger or just larger because it's more persistent, uh, I think would be very interesting, especially with your new data, uh, some, unpacking some of those dynamics. Um, the external val validity, um, so, so I think you find that 31% of your control group finds work three months after the inf intervention. That seems high, right? So mm. in the QLFS, it's about 10%. In our data, it's about 12%. I've, I mean, I have no reason to think that your results won't generalize to other subpopulations. In fact, my, my knee jerk is it probably would, but it would be interesting to, to just have a discussion about how this group differs from from others. And then your local linear regressions, I, I wonder whether for some cases reporting the slope coefficients rather than the predicted employment would um, convey your message. Right, thanks. Respond? Uh, yeah, I'll respond very quickly. Thanks, Rolf. Those are all great suggestions and we can do a lot of those. Um, I think there are two points maybe worth highlighting. One is, I agree with you, it is, this is not what I expected. It's consistent with the behavioral story where there's a more credible signal from this. Yeah. We shouldn't expect full updating in either the world, basically, because people should have some reasonable prior about what their previous skills are. We can't rule out a story that this difference could be contributing to this difference. You're right that that's definitely consistent with our results. A kind of bad test we can do for that is just say the ratio of the treatment effects on beliefs is much smaller than the ratio of the treatment effects on employment status. That's a very strong linearity assumption. It's probably not true, but I think that at this point, that's the closest answer we can get. Um, in terms of measuring whether people in the private treatment group tried to use this report for job applications, we do ask that in the second end line, so we'll be able to speak to it then. Uh, we don't know at this point. Um, on the Anderson Index, you summarized flawlessly what the strengths and weaknesses of it. You're entirely right that if there are one outlying thing can completely mess, mess up the index there. When we look at disaggregated search behavior and we break this down, we see some treatment effects, but we really don't see a robust pattern of, of changes. So like, I think if we really wanted to, to chase them, we could try and do it, and we're a little reluctant to push that too hard. Um, and the last point that I, I should note is this transition rate into employment. Um, in some senses, it, it looks quite high. But one of the reasons for that is we don't actually have zero employment at baseline. We have employment at baseline that is somewhat similar to this, because the, the basic rule for our sample selection is people who are in the sample cannot have formal work at the time, but they could be doing something to generate income. So we see it, I think we should do this more precisely. I think we'll see a transition rate that's not tremendously different to the QLFS. We should do that. But I do think this is definitely a selected sample in the sense that they are actively involved in job search. And I think one thing that would be super cool going forward is to kind of compare samples that are coming out of nationally represented data to samples like those coming out of our papers and see how similar do those look and can we tell some more general story about the behavior of these search active people versus the general population? And now that we have a bunch of these studies, it's definitely something we could do. Cool. Thanks. Sir. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. So, the, the absolutely fantastic paper. Uh, well done. Um, 
I just had w one niggly uh, point that I was trying to think of uh, how to make it constructive. And I, so I was, I was wondering, so exactly to your point, is it the case, like, why would you think that because there isn't a World Bank logo on a letter, um, would they not give it out? Uh, I know I, I used to work for the World Bank, and I know mm. that whenever we mention we're in a, in a place, like it completely transforms the expectations in the neighborhood. Mm. And so, so then I was wondering, so what really, like, is another way of interpreting this that you're actually giving a more credible signal? It's, it's not so much that they're more likely to signal it, it's actually that you're mm. adding credibility to it. And you'll find out, of course, the likelihood in your, in your end line. Mm. But I think one, if you have the resources for it, one cool thing to do would be to do an audit study where you just randomize whether you put the World Bank logo mm -hmm. on it. And that would be able to inform retrospectively what exactly is the mechanism that's going on there. Because it's not that it's mm -hmm. not interesting if it's the World Bank giving the signaling device. Mm -hmm. It is. that like, Maybe it is that not only do people need to signal their mm -hmm. quality, but they need supports in terms of being able to credibly signal those. I'm sure you've thought about these, but just in case mm -hmm. you haven't. Yeah, no, I think it's a great point. We are, we informally experimented with different combinations of logos on these reports, just in qualitative focus groups with firms, and, and not a proper qualitative study, just like a, a brief exploration. And certainly from the firm side, this and our partner were the ones they wanted. They were less excited about university logos. There was definitely a, like, ugh, academics. Um, so these are the ones that they seem to regard as credible. On the work seeker side, one thing we can do is just write down a Bayesian learning model where people have some prior about their skills, they get new information about their skills from this report, and we can basically use that plus the difference between private and public groups to back out how much more credible the signal is to, to work seekers just using the structure of Bayesian updating. Oh, we sure, can't no, do that I, I, I was talking to the, about the employers. But okay, yeah, no, I, see, yeah. I, see that, I see that point, but I, mm. yeah. Yeah, I think it would be cool to do that. I agree. Cheers, Rob. Um, so my question is kind of following up on a similar theme, mm -hmm. and I'm more interested in hearing more about like the firm sides, and in particular whether these people are applying for the same jobs. Um, so I'm thinking like, if I'm an employer and 20 people apply for this job, and five of them have this World Bank logo letter from the public treatment, what does that change my beliefs about the other 15? Whereas if I'm an employer, there's only three people applying for my job from this sample and only one of them has a letter, I probably don't change my beliefs. So, yeah, I don't know if you have information on that and whether you can kind of ease concerns about there being this negative effect on people without the public treatment. Yeah, I think that's a very fair question. At this point, our study is small enough that we think there are going to be no GE effects. So that as a share of employee of people searching for work in this province, it's negligible. It's certainly, if we scale this up, we could see something very different. And so the next phase of research that we're busy trying to do at the moment is working directly with firms and varying the information that they have to test if firms presented with fewer or more candidates with this, uh, with this information to hire differently. I would say Ruloff's prior paper that he mentioned briefly does an audit study where they send um, applications to firms with or without reference letters. And when they vary the share, if I, tell me if I'm quoting this incorrectly, when they vary the share of, of applications with reference letters, they don't find spillover effects in the people who don't have reference letters. Mm. Um, and so I think that's kind of, that suggests this is maybe not, at least not entirely something that we crowd out at scale. Any other questions? Right, thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, hi everyone. Um, I'll be lecturing the last presentation, or sorry, I'll be presenting the last presentation. Uh, it's called a, stru a Structural Approach to Modeling Employment Transitioning in South Africa. Um, just some background to the paper is uh, I initially have done work before trying to, to solve a dynamic, discrete choice dynamic, dynamic programming model. And even though the model solves, I always feel slightly uncomfortable about whether I'm able to, to truly capture reservation wages and uh, what's actually the identification behind my model. So this is kind of, there's a fancier model in the background that, I've, that I'm playing around with, but this is a step backwards to a static model uh, so that I'm more confident about what is actually driving my results in the, dy in the dynamic model. Okay, so also uh, the, the paper I've submitted that, that Rob read is, Got uh, the last chapter is on dynamic. I won't be presenting anything on that. Okay. Um, so I'm briefly going to introduce kind of a motivation behind the paper, uh, introduce the data, um, some descriptives, 
then I'll be setting up my structural model, um, then I'll be fitting it on the quarterly labor force survey data, uh, first just in the parametric model, then a more complicated finite mixture model that allows for unobserved heterogeneity, and then last as a kind of novel step that I'm, I've been playing around with uh, the last month, I'll move that data from the QLFS to NIDS um, and compare the posterior probabilities of being type 1 and type 2 um, in my model. Okay. So the, the introduction, to which uh, should not be new to anyone who's worked on South Africa, is that we've got this huge unemployment problem, especially among uh, black youth. Uh, I'm going to be focusing just on the uh, black males in my, in my analysis. It's because when you're modeling all the decisions, black males are much easier than, than black females because uh, you don't have to model the fertility decision as well. Obviously, the unemployment issue is much larger for black females than it is for black males, but I, f I think I'd first try and answer the easier one before moving on to, to, to actually uh, explaining for black females as well. Um, so we see that black males are, uh, regardless of age, much less likely to be employed. Uh, but we're, we can't really uh, distinguish whether this unemployment is driven by, by low job offer rates or high reservation wages. So we don't know if it's necessarily supply or demand side driven. Um, and that's basically what I'm going to try and attempt uh, in my paper today. So the data, I'm going to be using two data sets. For most of the paper, I'll be using the QRFS, uh, which is the quarterly labor force survey data. It's collected as, as implied every, uh, every three months. The nice part of that is if we're, we're going to be using the transitioning in and out of employment to try and get a hold of what reservation wages might be. So the, the for shorter the periods, the more transitions you see and, and kind of the more people you have and the more, more confident you are in your estimates. The downside, so the upside of the QRFS also is it's very large, uh, which is especially important in structural modeling. It's a very greedy method with regard to, to sample size since you'll be using a maximum likelihood to, to solve your parameters. Uh, the downside of the QRFS is uh, we don't have as many interesting variables that we, we can play around with. And that's why my motivation for, at the end, moving over to NIDS, but my reason for not starting with NIDS is, I think, pretty straightforward, is uh, I'll, I won't have enough sample size, and also I'm fearful that, that only being able to see someone every two years uh, will make the short-term transitioning, uh, it's kind of this dramatic there, okay. Uh, just some descriptives. Interestingly, um, uh, when we compare the entry and exit rates, this is for black men and, and white men, uh, I would have thought, and I think most, most people would, would have thought that the drastic difference would have been in the movement into employment. And that seems almost identical. Fair enough, this is a smooth line, but I, I have non-smooth. Uh, I can give you transition probabilities as well. It's very similar for, for young white males and black, sorry, for white and black males. The drastic difference is in job exit rates, um, which I think all, often in policy discussions go, could go unnoticed or unmentioned at least. Everyone tries to get people into jobs, but usually they probably get in, in, put in worse jobs and soon will transition out of it. Uh, and I think we, we already saw that the likelihood of being employed is, is much higher for white males and the expected wage is also much higher. Um, some of this ex you can explain by, by, among black males, I've been distinguished uh, the entry rates and the exit rates by education. And again, we see, even among education levels, the entry rates are very similar. Um, but the, the exit rates are dramatically different. So uh, the more education you have, the less likely you are to, to exit out of, out of a, a job and the employment probabilities and wage probabilities follow the obvious order. So what I'm going to be trying to do today is, is uh, derive a reservation wage. And the background is if we see a lot of unemployment, this unemployment is either due to uh, uh, low job arrivals, people don't get offered jobs, or it's due to people having high reservation wage. So if we, uh, if we can 
confidently say what reservation wages are. We, we move a long way forward in, in saying whether we think unemployment is driven by uh, demand side or supply side factors. Uh, we start with self-reported reservation wages. This is taken from NIDS. And we see if, if we ask people and we take the average, uh, people say that they would be willing to work for roughly 4,000 or 3,000 rand a month, which is fairly low for, for educated people and um, so for some of our audience. But uh, despite it being low, we still think this is uh, upwardly biased. And the reason we think so is the literature has suggested that reservation wages, if they're self-reported, are often inflated. The main reason for this is uh, people often answer, if you ask them directly, they often answer what they think is a fair wage rather than what is actually their reservation wage. Similarly, they mistake the, the surveying process as kind of a bargaining about a, perhaps a potential job and, and they don't answer what the minimum wage uh, is that they would be willing to work for. Um, unsurprisingly, often, uh, so this paper, I don't think, was in South Africa, uh, but we found the same in, in I think, in the CAPS data. When, even, when we ask people what their minimum wage, but sorry, what their reservation wage is, we often see them taking jobs that pay less than that they claim their reservation wages were in the following uh, wave. Okay, so all methods uh, we're going to be using uh, won't be using self-reported reservation wages. We'll instead try to back it out of a model and try and find a reservation wage that explains what we see in the labor data. Um, yeah, I'll just jump to model. Um, so the model that I'm setting up, I'm trying to find, as I said, a reservation that, that is able to explain the moments we see in the data. Uh, the earnings are allowed to be follow the kind of a default min Syrian. Uh, being a function of education and age, but I also allow it to be a remuneration draw uh, and an idiosyncratic uh, error, which is basically the measurement error um, in your wage. And then I also allow this utility of labor, which is identical to reservation wage, since this will not be a dynamic uh, choice, so it's going to be a once-off static every time, every period you can decide whether you want to be stay employed or uh, if you offer the job, you can, you can decide if you're going to take it, but you don't think about the future when making a decision. Uh, but I allow for a slightly more flexible age profile in the reservation wage there, uh, purely because I played around with, with kind of a more flexible approach, and I saw that the age profile seems to, to follow this curvature. Okay, so the, the kind of where identification is going to be drawn from is we've got one side where we have entry into to, uh, jobs, and that's kind of a two-tiered step. So if, to move from non-employment to employment, you firstly have to be offered a job, and you have to say, say yes or no to the job, right? And often structural papers are very bad at, at being able to, to tell which one of those things is it's determining whether you got a job or not, since even if we have data on whether you were offered a job, that's also usually badly captured. Um, instead, in my paper, I'll be using the bottom side, uh, or I'll, I'll also be using the bottom side, the bottom side or the, the exit out of employment, which I think is a better way of identifying reservation wages, since you don't have to be offered to leave your job to leave a job. So whenever you want to leave a job, you're, you're able to leave a job. So I think uh, this paper is useful in exploiting that side of uh, the model to, to to get at a, what could be a, a good reservation wage. Uh, it's worth noting that uh, we also model the probability of being fired, uh, and that is very much determined by, by your tenure, uh, as you'll see in curves uh, going forward. So the maximum likelihood, I'll be using likelihood functions of all four of these possible transitions. When I fit them, uh, we've got three three possible transition periods. So there's four waves, but you can move from wave one to two, two to three, three to four. And I maximize the likelihood of all three of these transitions. For so every person has three transitions. When we fit uh, the model, we get uh, expected wages that, that follow the same shape and uh, kind of magnitudes as an Syrian model. And we get reservation wages that, that follow the kind of the inverse result 
Uh, it's easier uh, to graph it than to interpret it, but uh, you can see at least it follows for, for all S results. I also, I didn't put the job entry and job exit uh, right here. I, it's easier to drawing them than, than interpreting them because uh, there's a lot of coefficients. Okay, so the, interestingly, with the reservation wage, we see a drop from age 15 to 30. Uh, I think this this is consistent with what we could expect uh, if, if we think uh, people might be learning about their variability as they, they try and uh, enter the, the labor market. Initially, you think you're, you're very capable, and as you try and get job interviews and people decline you, you, you become more, uh, more unbiased about your actual ability. It could also be social pressure where when you're young enough, you've got a family or a household income, but you don't have pressure to, to, to look for, for employment. But as you get, go older, uh, there's more pressure and less of a safety net in your household, and you get pushed into to trying to find work. Uh, we also see uh, the reservation wage increasing dramatically at retirement age. I think this, this shouldn't be surprising. Uh, yeah. Uh, interestingly, the, although our reservation wages are much lower than the South Reporter reservation wages, and ours is, ours, ours is a log scale and this is not, it does follow a similar shape at least to the South Reported reservation wages in NIDS. Uh, the job offer rates were allowed to vary by tertiary, sorry, by education and by uh, age in a, in a squared uh, form. And we see that the, the probability of being offered a job what didn't vary dramatically. By education, it did vary somewhat by age. Uh, the probability of, the, of accepting a job when offered was high for, for everyone. Uh, we see that it follows, as you'd expect, the, it's basically a function of your reservation wage and your uh, offered wage. So as you grow older, uh, you're less likely to decline a job. And as you grow into retirement, you're more willing to, to forego the job you probably already have. Uh, interestingly, when the probability of being fired, we see uh, it was a function of log tenure, and it follows the, the expected shape where uh, uh, the more experience you have, uh, the less likely you are. The more you, long you've been in the current job, the less likely you are to be, be fired. Okay, then we go to the finite mixture model. Uh, the justification is we think there's still some unobserved characteristics and differences that we don't uh, fully controlled for in our model, so we want to allow for different types. And since we have these repeated waves, uh, we're able to kind of, as we're, we're willing to assume the same individual stays the same type, we can kind of back out what, what uh, groupings of individuals society has. Uh, so the model we alter, we allow the reservation wage for one group to be higher than the other group, we allow the we allow the reservation wage to vary, we allow the expected wage to vary for one group in second, and we allow the job entry and job exit rates also to vary. Sorry, the job entry rates and the fire rate to vary. We don't tell it in which direction to vary, the model tells us we think it varies in this direction. So that's a very important distinction. So the model is gonna tell us how one group varies to another group. Um, when we fit this model, uh, we get one large group, which uh, is roughly 80% of the population, uh, sorry, 88% of the population who has least des desirable attributes, and we've got a much smaller group that's 10% of the black male population that has more desirable attributes. So they have higher reservation wages, higher ex uh, expected wage offers, slightly higher probability of getting a job offer and much less likely to, to be fired once they're in a job. So this is the easier way of seeing it. So type one is the less desired group, that's 90% of black males. Type two is the 10% with the more desirable attributes. Um, so these dramatic differences in re reservation wage. Uh, slightly differences in probability of saying, uh, yes, if you're offered a job. Not a large difference in being offered a job but dramatic differences in being fired once you have a job. Um, I found that, that interesting, but uh, I can't argue with the model. Um, 
So, as we say, well, you, we, we end up getting one desired group and one less desired group. Um, interestingly, I've shown this in a previous presentation, but the more desired group face labor outcomes that are very similar to the white population. Uh, kind of similar job offers and similar probability of being fired. Uh, while, uh, yeah. So the, the question that, that kind of we, we couldn't solve with KLFS is now, it seems like there's a more desired group and less desired group, but we don't, we don't know what unobservable attributes might be driving these, these groupings. Um, it could be that the one group is more productive, one group could be more able, they could have uh, had a wealthier household when, when growing up, more co connections. It could also be a path dependency, where once you find a job, you kind of get experience and you stay in the labor market uh, while other people don't. Um, but to answer this question, or have a better attempt at answering it, we used our data and simulated a lot of moments for millions and millions of people and then fitted this data to NIDS. It would have been much easier if NIDS was also quarterly. Obviously, NIDS is biannually, so this is why we couldn't just take the beta straight over. We had to, to fit, it, uh, fit it on the moments. Um, so we do that. And we compare the probability of being of type 1 and 2 uh, for a range of, of, of variables. And we see that the probability of being of type 2, which is the mo more desirable group, is, like, is more likely if you're urban. Uh, it's more likely if you have a formal job or a written contract or a permanent contract, so a more formal uh, form of employment. It's also, although only slightly, uh, it's mo more probable if you're from a wealthier school and if your parents are more educated, and if you scored higher on the numeracy score. Um, it's worth noting here that the probabilities don't differ dramatically, but part of that is because we're only fitting on transitions at the moment. We're not fitting on tenure and, and on the absolute starting value. So I think if we wanted to be, go more structural, we'd have gotten more accurate and more kind of confident results in the difference, but at least the direction they appear to be going is, is consistent with, with what we'd expect. Okay, so the take home message is with regard to job entry and job exit rates, it seems that much of unemployment might be driven by job exit rate differences. The reservation wages that we back out uh, are much lower than the self reported reservation wages. Uh, we find that most job offers get, get accepted, and then, part of my spelling mistakes, uh, with regard to heterogeneity, we find that there is a much smaller group of black males who do significantly better than their peers. They have higher wage, uh, higher reservation wage, wages, higher wage offers, uh, lower firing rates, uh, and slightly higher probability of being offered uh, jobs. So basically, similar attributes to, to white males. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much, Clovis. I really enjoyed reading the paper, and I think that it was exciting to see because it mirrors a lot of the challenges we've encountered in our own work. So we measure reservation wages. We find exactly the same pattern you do. They're very high. Either people are extremely optimistic about what they could potentially earn, or they're just misunderstanding the question. And we play around quite a lot with different ways of measuring, and I think we get closer as we do more sophisticated measures, but they're still just really, really, really high. So I think the problem you're trying to solve here is a really important one. Um, and I'm going to offer four suggestions on things that I think might, might move the modeling forward. The first is that the trade-off for structural stuff is always that we make some assumptions and we learn more stuff. And the, the question is kind of how realistic are the assumptions? And so I think there are two things that would be helpful to try and get a sense of, of how, whether the structures get us to the right place. The one is relatively straightforward, which is just to do some more out-of-sample validation. So estimate the model of everyone aged up to, say, 50 and then predict forward, or leave out mm. some five-year periods during the middle and predict outcomes for those, uh, for works, sorry, for works at those ages and check do they roughly match what you're seeing in the data. The second thing is much more ambitious and much harder, and you've actually already started to do it, which is super exciting, which is taking one set of data to estimate the model and another set of data to see what happens with the model. So in the dynamic version of the model, you have the entire life cycle of employment transitions for everyone. You could take that to the National Income Dynamics Study and see if that matches those two-year job transitions. 
I think that'd be really difficult, but it'd be super cool if you could do it because it's a very stringent test of the model. It's basically taking entirely different data and taking if you can replicate. Um, then there are three things that are currently in the model, but I think could be more extensively in the model that might be useful. One is, there, as I understand it, there are returns to tenure on job exit, but not on wages, if that's right. Yeah. And so I think one of the challenges with that is basically the model doesn't accommodate this mechanism of I take a job that's terrible because I think mm -hmm. it's going to get better over time. And so I, know, I don't think that's something you can comprehensively speak to with the Cure LFS data because you don't see employ, um, earnings through time. But one thing you could do to kind of test whether we should worry about this is look at the people who you observe for four periods who are employed for more than one of those four periods and basically check does the job exit probability between periods two and three or the earnings change between two periods two and three depend on what's happening in period one. Mm. Um, I think you're going to run out of data sooner or later doing that, <coughs> but you could at least do one period and see how much it matters. The second thing that would be cool to include is on the job search. And I think mm. we find in our data, and, and I guess for a lot of you probably find in yours, people who have jobs continue to do some searching. Right now, as I understand it, the way the model is set up is that if I take a job, there's a really high opportunity cost because I can't simultaneously search for a job mm. while I hold that one. And as a result, I'm more likely to reject kind of lowish wage offers in the hope of getting a better draw. And so the extreme alternative you could do for this is just allow the same on the job search as off the job search. And that's then, I think, going to induce people to accept more marginal jobs and drive down reservation wages in the model. I don't really know which of those is a better assumption or a worse assumption, but it would be cool to see both yeah. and see how sensitive the results are. And then my last question was just about migrants. So as I understand it, the way the QLFS is set up, they don't track a household that moves. They just go back mm -hmm. to the same dwelling. So what that means is we're basically going to miss everyone who migrates, and in particular, we might miss people who migrate for work. Exactly. So what it would be cool to do is look at the National Income of Dynamics Study and see what share of household moves are correlated right. with job transitions. And that can give you some sense of, like, are you missing a lot of people who are transitioning mm. from jobs, or are you missing only a handful of people? I think that's easy to do with NIDS. I, I don't know if it's going to be an answer you want to hear or not, <laughs> but I think it would be interesting just to get a sense uh, of whether we should think of migration as a big issue for the model or a relatively small issue. But I generally enjoyed reading it a lot, and I think, yeah, the problem you're trying to solve is one that I really appreciate needs to be solved. Cool. Um, I'll quickly try and respond to most of the questions. Sorry, uh, Rob, that's really helpful. Um, yeah, so reservation wages, I, I know some of the surveys, we often, we're getting closer at being, finding more informative reservation wages by kind of asking better questions and, and trying to pose it in a better way. Um, and yeah, I also think my, I'm probably underestimating reservation wages, but at least we're getting kind of a, a bound estimate of what we could possibly be minimum wage, uh, uh, yeah, minimum wages. Um, I agree with you, you're out of sample and, and kind of sh uh, moving from one data set to another is, is a good way of testing if, if your model is correct. It's always painful showing these estimates to people because people get fixated in what's wrong and not <laughs> in how you're trying to fit it. Um, so I've given up trying to show people that, but I do have that in the background often trying to, to at least my own faith in the model. Um, so some of your suggestions with, with on the job search and kind of getting a job and trying to get a better job, this is things I've, I've explicitly addressed in an earlier version of a paper where we had two types of job, an informal one and a, a mm. formal one and you're allowed to search while you're informal and kind of a two job, job sector. Uh, that just got out of, out of hand <laughs> and I might, my co-author still wants me to, to distinguish between informal and informal. It, with structural model, it often just, because you're, you're not bound by what you're able to add to the model, you often just go crazy and this is kind of my, my step back in trying to, to but definitely, um, I think I found out with that, that paper that if you don't allow for on-job search, no one takes, if you do not allow for on-the-job search, uh, people are obviously much less likely to take informal jobs. If you allow for on-the-job search, people love taking informal jobs because it allows them to, to, to search. So that's, you know, that's dead on. Um, so the question or the point with QLFS and, and migration, yeah, the, the same point was mentioned when I present this back home. Um, so, so the upside of QLF is, is all the repetition, and, and, but NEDS is definitely better in following people. So we'll probably be 
underestimating the transition into employment because if people move, uh, we won't be capable of following. Um, we could limit our sample to only, to only uh, urban, urban men perhaps, uh, at least the bias would be less dramatic, but there still, still probably would be some bias in not being able to follow people. And I, I think taking it to a, to a more trusted data set is definitely a, a good idea to, to kind of test if, if, if at least we're close to being correct. Yeah. Um, it's worth noting while you're saying taking it to other data sets, in our, in our QLFS, I don't show it here, we found that uh, roughly 88% of people were of type 1, and when we took it to nerds, we found it to be uh, roughly 90%. So, I mean, other stuff could have gone horribly wrong, but at least <laughs> that probability seems to say that we're doing, uh, we're doing fine. But I sh there's other moments I could fit on as well. And, and but this is super cool, because so few structural papers do this out, yeah. out of data prediction. I really like that. Thanks. Uh, I think I addressed most of it. I'm willing to open to the floor. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Um, I think it's a really important question, and I really like your approach. I particularly like the, um, the mixture model with the types, and I wonder if you could bring out more on that and tell us what uh, observable characteristics are correlated with these types, because um, it's <laughs> going to help us kind of interpret your model. But I really like that approach. Um, Second thing I say is Rob's comments are like really great. Um, I will make sure you get a copy of his notes. Um, <laughs> I, I think you're going about this in the right way, though. Like you want to start. Um, you don't want to chuck in everything that Rob said in one go because things will go <laughs> bad. Um, so like build it up slowly. But um, you, your results at the moment are like really promising. Um, and then the final thing I'll say is um, linking back to your motivation. So in your first few slides, you showed that the entry rates are pretty much the same for white and black males. I think. Um, but the wages were significantly higher for white males. And then you were kind of motivating the paper by saying the exit rates are uh, vastly different. So my, I suspect that they're taking like different types of jobs. And at the moment, I think you, you're probably struggling to pick that up in your model. But once you add in like more dynamics of uh, the value of taking a job uh, changes your future value of other future employment, I suspect you'll be able to be able to explain that difference. And, and then you'll have a really nice way of linking that motivation to your model, and your model should hopefully be able to explain that, because at the moment you pose a really nice puzzle, and you estimate the model, but I, I think you're not bringing it back around to explain that puzzle at the end. Um, but as you add more things into your model, I think you should be able to do that. Um, but yeah, I really like where this is going. Well, thanks. Um, yeah, the fitting it on observables, I always find that, perhaps I'm not trained enough in this, but I always find it awkward, because because you fit on observables, and then you see the groups differ on observables, and then I feel I should be adding those observables then to the model. <laughs> but, but, but you mean the observables are already in the model, uh, like education and... Not uh, even necessarily. It will be really actually interesting if your model is predicting these two types, and then you can say, I'm not targeting these observable characteristics with my model, but it is explaining why they have different outcomes. I don't think I fully follow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, that's, okay, sorry, but that's a more explicit example. Um, so I, I, I definitely thought about that as well. So if you mean that I group black and white males together, running regression, you find that uh, now the sample of probability of being of type 2 is 20%. And it's half white males and half black males. It, it could be a justification kind of. It's where my paper is going anyway, so. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah, I don't. I can talk to you about this, the second thing. I don't think I fully understand the question. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions? Cool. Thank you, everyone.